Hey, everybody, it's Tabitha. I just wanted to let you know that in this episode of our podcast, Ace Whitman and I are back at it talking about neurodiversity relationships and your next steps. So don't miss it. Join us inside. Welcome back, everybody, to the CPTSD podcast. This is part two of our conversation with Ace Whitman. Before we move into that, I just want to ask you to please like, subscribe, share, save, whatever it is that you do with this type of content to help it spread far and wide. So Ace, in part one, we were talking about neurodivergence, relationships, and I'm going to introduce you real quick, but then let's dive into that relational piece because I think that's crucial. So Ace, okay. you you have Ace's Trauma Recovery um, mm-hmm. and uh, you experience yourself as a neurodivergent queer therapist who is trying to figure out how to decolonize and <laughs> restructure our entire system. And the good news is you're not alone. Yes, um, <laughs> that helps. The, the harder <laughs> news is, shoot, I think that's going to take a little bit of time. But you're a licensed clinical professional counselor. And mm-hmm. some of the values that I've picked up from you over time are community, authenticity, and like commitment to healing. Mm-hmm. So that commitment to healing piece is really important. And if people in our audience are starting a trauma recovery journey, Um, or realizing that they may have neuroatypical pieces to them, the relationship that they have with other people in the community, but especially a professional who should be anchored and have the the things to get you moving forward, that's crucial. Mm -hmm. And a big component I've heard you talking about is that that relationship absolutely must be safe. 100% absolutely safety is by far the first priority with every single interaction with every single um, client so every time so how do people find that like if I were brand new Mm -hmm. and trying to figure out how to find a therapist how would you encourage me to identify safety or a safe uh, place um well so the so the first thing that comes to my mind is um is that person authentic? Is that therapist? Like, do they, they, do they talk to you like they're a real human being (laughs) and like you're a real human being, right? Like, do they, um, are they able to see that the ways in which you are struggling and understand the ways in which you are struggling are rooted in a response to the surroundings, to your surroundings, to your experiences, to your feeling not safe and and reacting to that or do they are they um operating from this place and perspective that there's something inherently wrong with you (laughs) um or if there's something broken within you um like it is not safe for me to interact with people whether they're professional or not uh who operate from the belief that like that there is something wrong with me (laughs) like that that no just no, just no, right. and no, just no is absolutely <laughs> FM, right. And, um, and that, that thinking right there has its roots in white supremacy, which we talked a little bit, a tiny bit about uh-huh. in the last podcast. And we don't have to delve too much into that because I think we uh-huh. probably could just do a whole one on that issue. Sounds good to me. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, I'll just make a note. Um, how, because we're so steeped in what we expect from medical professionals and therapists are medical professionals, mm-hmm. how, I don't even know that I would know how to understand if they were presenting as safe. So I'll just share one tip for me as somebody who is neuro- mm-hmm. neurodivergent, but not diagnosed with anything specific. I have mm-hmm. my own ideas about what's mm-hmm. going on up there, right? And in me, if I can't feel you when you're talking mm-hmm. to me, I'm not that interested because mm-hmm. I'm a feeler. I'm really mm-hmm. kinesthetic and I can feel if you're lying. I can feel if you're truthing. <laughs> I can't, you know. Yes. Right. So what would you say to that? Um, I, uh, I agree completely. And, uh, for me, it's really about listening to my nervous system, um, which took like, let's be real. That took a while before I could start to really understand and interpret what my, my nervous system was trying to 
to communicate with yep. me. But the ways in which like when I'm interacting with somebody who's not safe, especially if they're in a, in a position of authority um, is like, when I'm interacting with this person, does my body start to shift its physiology? Am I, you know, am I, is my heart rate increasing? Is my stomach starting to turn? Are my muscles starting to become tense? Am I getting stuck in my head about uh, what this person is thinking about me? You know, like all of these signs are signs that my body is going into a fight or flight response. Um, and, uh, or the other extreme, if I just feel completely disconnected and start dissociating, like those are all signs that my brain is interpreting this interaction as unsafe. Mm -hmm. And I have really learned that a central part of my trauma recovery process has been listening to that and honoring that what my body is communicating to me. And so like, if I have these interactions with somebody, especially if they're, they're supposed to be helping me, and instead, my body's reacting in this way in which I don't feel safe, then I don't continue. <laughs> Fantastic. I mean, that's really great advice. And I mean, from my same perspective, understanding my neurology and starting to listen to it differently is 100% huge in the recovery process. I want to play devil's advocate for just a minute because, okay. and, 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 and it's not really challenging you. It's like, and pay attention to this also. I yes. agree. <laughs> track the physiology, a hundred percent track it. And remember that if you are just starting your journey, calling a therapist at all is traumatizing and scary. Mm, and yes. so if you don't get a good vibe off the first one, that doesn't mean you throw it out the window, you put it on pause and here, mm -hmm. this is an exercise for those of mm -hmm. us with trauma about all or nothing thinking or, you know, mm. catastrophic thinking. So that's also a reason that I encourage you to interview more than one person. Mm -hmm. And if somebody's no, then trust that. Yes. Right. Or, if it's, right. But yeah. if somebody's like, I'm not sure, then put, make a list of people that mm -hmm. you're not sure about and then pick the best one out of that list. Yep. Yep. And remember, yeah. And I think. Go I ahead. think that you make a really, really good point. Like early in, in the trauma recovery process, so much, like so there were so many things that were triggering for me and overwhelmed. And my nervous system was just completely wrecked, right? And so every little thing could could trigger my nervous system to react. And so like um, early on, it, it really did take a lot of slowing down and really paying attention and starting to pull out those pieces of like, is this, is this, reaction in this situation really about this situation or is it triggering an emotional flashback yes. maybe you know like maybe maybe there was something about this that reminded me of times where situations in the past that have not been safe but that's not really what's going on here and that is a really important like distinction to make is like are you having a reaction because the situation isn't safe or are you having a reaction because it, the situation reminds you of a time when it wasn't safe? Yeah. And sorting that out at the beginning is more complicated than midway through. So we, I want to encourage you that yes. if that's where you're at, me too. I've been there. We get it. Sounds mm -hmm. like we both get it, Ace. For um, sure. <laughs> so 100%. I, right. And, and just one more caveat on the end. Let's say that you pick somebody off that list and it's not a hit in one to three sessions, you know, for some reason connect or you're not getting helped, right? It's okay to leave a therapist without any explanation. Yes. And it's also okay to communicate. Like if you're feeling frustrated or feeling stuck or feeling like the, the way in which the therapist is trying to help you isn't really quite what you need, that's okay. It's, it's okay. And if, you communicate that and the therapist reacts negatively to it, well, then it's a sign that probably that therapist isn't the right fit for you right. uh, because they probably have their own stuff to work on. Um, but uh, it is such an important part of the trauma recovery process to be able to start to identify ways in which things work for you and ways in which things don't, because it's not, it's not a like blanket across the board, one size fits all process, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it is very individual and very much like it can shift and change as you go in. And, and my trauma recovery process has very much like things that didn't work for me, you know, five years ago may very well be really helpful for me today because I'm in a different space and a different place in my recovery. And so like 
forcing myself to try to keep doing something that's not working um, isn't it isn't helpful. Like like it's it's been really helpful for me to be able to recognize. Okay, I made the effort, and like I I you know gave it a good you know oomph attempt, and uh, and it's not working. It's not helping me feel safe. It's not helping me to like uh, move through this journey where I can uh, process or understand or whatever. And so like that's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Let's figure out something else to try. And and really like so much of my process has been like, all right, that didn't work. Let me try this. <laughs> and, that's and just keep going through it. Right. And that's exactly what you should hear from a therapist. If you, if you're brave and I'm not saying you're not brave, if you choose not to do this, sometimes the best thing is to walk away. But Mm -hmm. if you feel like it would be good for you to say something to your therapist and they don't say, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, let's rework. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do it. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Right. 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 If they respond that way. Yeah. It's time. It's like, I I think the, the thing that I, I want people who I'm helping to understand the most is that it is the number one priority is to honor your needs as much as possible, as much as you're able to. And, um, and so like, if you're, if you're seeking help and it's not helping and you try to communicate like the ways in which it's not helping or not working for you uh, and, and the reaction is to like, either say you're not working hard enough or you're not doing it the right way or yada, yada, like that is not honoring your needs at all. (laughs) And it's bad therapy. And it's bad therapy. I'll just name, I'm just going to name it. That's bad therapy. It is very bad therapy. uh, So I um, promised in our last episode that we were going to hook into um, some of the ways that you can tell the difference between what we've been describing and talking about as complex or developmental trauma And those Mm -hmm. are different things. There are other podcasts that I've done about the definition there. So please go listen to those if you need more. Um, Complex trauma can occur anytime in your life cycle. And one of the things that has been (laughs) traumatic for me in the last bit of time, three, four years, is realizing that I have to reframe my life from new information that I have. Right. And I mean, welcome to humanity. That's what we do every day. (laughs) But the reframing is around neurodivergence. Mm -hmm. And um, there are a couple of different ways to try and sort out what is developmental or traumatic event trauma and what is trauma from having been neurodivergent. And there's overlap. I mean, they're not clearly distinct categories that we can Mm -hmm. separate, which is why we keep saying that's complicated and complex. (laughs) But there is Uh a process of realizing that you have been functioning from a place that's not really you for so very long that is traumatic in itself Mm -hmm. and and grief ridden. Right. And so, (laughs) (laughs) so I'm just kind of setting up the conversation that understand that it's not always relieving to figure out that you might be neurodiverse or Mm. different than the Mm. typical brain. Mm -hmm. What would you start us off? What would you like to talk about there? Um, Well, I, 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 want to respond directly to that last comment that like, it's not always relieving. For me, it was, Mm -hmm. for me, it was very relieving to have the information to like, have a like, complete, like an understanding of like, oh, this is why life has been so damn hard for me um, in every aspect of my life, right? And it's like, uh, for me, that's how my brain works, right? Like, I like to have the information. I, uh, I very much survival mechanism that de- been dependent on my ability to understand what's happening around me and to like lean into my um, like cognitive side of things, uh, mostly because it never felt safe to be present in my body. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> but uh but you're absolutely right. It's not, it, it may not be a relief for everybody. And and there could be extreme or there could be anywhere in between uh, where like that information is, is still really overwhelming and confusing. And um, especially if, if you come from a place where you don't really understand what it actually means. And mm-hmm. um, cause like society teaches us and right. Like I have been, I, I have fallen into this as well, where like, I understood autism from the perspective that that there's something 
wrong with how your brain developed, that, that there is something like that interferes with your ability to um to do you know any handful of things but that like that it's only like like certain severity levels right like that like somebody who's autistic must be unable to like live and work and and function in society in a healthy way right um and like the the stigma that's been attached to that has definitely impacted how i um perceived uh, autism and also how I misunderstood and misread myself mm -hmm. um, because like so much of my own uh, autistic traits um, did not fall within the way the society defines autism right and and neurodivergence and so like in my brain it, when you combine it with the the trauma response of needing to be and present perfect mm -hmm. um there was no way that I was going to be able to see that the ways in which I struggle were a result of trying to fit into a society that expected me to be neuro neurotypical. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that there are those stereotypes. I mean, for example, when people that are not in this field at all, uh, you know, when we talk about autism, I get a comment like, Oh, you mean like rain man? I mean, how old is that movie? Plus it's a white guy. <laughs> Right. <laughs> like, no, not like Rain Man. And, I, and I'm not trying to like diss that film or anything. Right. I don't even really remember it. But my point I don't is, either. <laughs> my point is, that's not what autism looks like. No offense, Dustin. Right. Not, not right. all the time. Some, some, right. of, some sometimes it might. Correct. Right. And so, right, but that, not, not for everyone. <laughs> right. And that really makes us think I can't be that. Mm -hmm. And yep. you're not. And maybe you're not that. I'm not. Absolutely. Either. Not. You know, one of the one of the like the like main um like go to like signs uh that somebody may have neurodivergence is the like inability to have eye contact or hold eye contact. Like that like I don't mind that at all, right? Same. Like I've I've got no problem one on one holding eye contact with somebody. This has never been an issue for me, right? Now if you get me in a group setting and I can't read everybody like everybody at the same time. I can't read what they're thinking and feeling and trying to like predict what they're gonna say or whatever, like then then my neurodivergence really kicks in <laughs> and that's when my brain goes kind of spastic and i can't like i can't word <laughs> no word, word. <laughs> no <laughs> no I, I, I like it's like a like it, it gets discombobulated in there and uh and then all of a sudden like i don't know how to do anything <laughs> <laughs> don't even know how to exist uh uh and and then my anxiety and then my trauma response response kicks in right like then when i'm feeling like i can't my brain's not functioning in the way that i want it to or that the way that it does when i feel comfortable and safe uh then like all then then here comes the shame and here comes the what's the questioning like what's wrong with me um and why can't i do these things and you know all of that and uh yeah it just spirals from there <laughs> totally and we're back into freeze dang it <laughs> yes oh i'm right? such a hardcore freeze type too <laughs> yep. and i mean for me when i get no word <laughs> that's usually when i have exhausted myself mm. And mm -hmm. what's more exhausting than trying to read everything going on in a room, right? So you're absolutely right that the stereotypes that we think of would indicate any type of um, neurodivergence. Like you don't have to be running around like a crazy person to be hyperactive. Some right. of that hyperactivity can be internalized. Oh my gosh, oh. my life changed when I realized that hyperactivity can be internalized. Right, right. Absolutely. Like, I realized, like, because, um, because I am such a hardcore freeze type, and because of all the trauma that I've experienced, that that was my, like, go to consistently. Um, my hyperactivity was very much in my head. Yeah. <laughs> it was in my nervous system. <laughs> um, and it, uh, it came out like, like, for instance, like when I think about stimming, right, like one of the the big things that that is, you know, a trait that's that is considered like autistic or within the on the spectrum somewhere is uh, this need to stim, right, which is like stimulating certain right. certain stimulations, right? Um, my stimming was never external. The most external that my stimming was uh, other than like chewing, I did a lot of chewing, right? Like lots and lots of like 
chewing my nails. I sucked my thumb until I was 12. <laughs> um, but like outside of that, like uh, I used to do this thing and actually I still I'll do it today but I, I remember her doing this when I was little like maybe like four or five every time I was in the in a car on the interstate you know the like the 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 white dotted lines I would take I'd take my toes and I'd go back and forth at the same rate as the lines right and it was like that was my way of stimming but nobody like I didn't it was it was very much like uh hidden from the world around me because I was too much in a freeze response to let anybody know that I was needing to stem. <laughs> and we probably right? didn't like, know that that's what we were needing other than the feeling. Right. Right. right, I, right. I think there are just to name a couple of things that are considered stims that you may not realize, not you Ace, but the mm -hmm. audience uh, may, it not may, realize. may also be me. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. But some of the most <laughs> common things that are considered stems, but we don't really think about that like societally, either because a lot of people do it or we don't see it, are your leg going like crazy under the table. Mm -hmm. That is a stem. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to any of you who are finding that shocking. Take a <laughs> breath. Take a breath. Another stem is chewing on the inside of your cheeks or your tongue. Mm -hmm. Right? When I used to do, when I was at the height of my stress, so childhood was when I was feeling really stressed, I would take one of my nails and put it on the uh, underneath the other one and poke the cuticle mm -hmm. right here. Mm -hmm. Stimming. Mm -hmm. Yep. Guess I, uh, one, one more, yeah. one more, one more, one more thing that is also a stim is. <laughs> so Vocal if you're sighing stimming. a lot, <laughs> yes. you're sighing a lot. <laughs> I actually, I have really learned to really love vocal stimming. Like, I, I think because I was a freeze type for so, like, so strongly for so long, and because um, I just did not express myself at all, like, it, it, and it was really hard for me to feel, like, comfortable vocally expressing myself. Um, like I have really learned to really enjoy the vocal stimming. <laughs> it's just like, just randomly say the same thing over and over again. Like, uh, like, you know, that song on TikTok, the happy, like the happy dog song. I could sing that song over and over. Do you know what I'm talking about? Well, I'm like, which happy dog song? Oh, <laughs> I get a lot of dog feed in my TikTok. <laughs> <Same. laughs> uh, uh, the, the one that goes, happy, happy. Happy boy, he's just a happy, happy, happy boy. <laughs> I just sing that song all the time, especially around my dog, who definitely is like that weird, goofy, like neuro he's got neuro problems, so like he falls over all the time. But he's just such a happy boy. <laughs> he he'll fall over and he'll just look at you and wag his tail. And I just have to sing that song over and over again because it just feels good. <laughs> Oh, okay. Also, another indicator that you may be neurodiverse is that you have an intense connection and love for animals. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, animals are so much safer than humans. <laughs> so much. And they're so loving. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's just break it down a little bit. Let's say mm -hmm. that you wanted to communicate with our audience. Like if you were starting this journey, what are some of the things you would look for? to help you decide if you might be neurodiverse and what, to, and what to do about it. So I will just tell you the things that I looked for and the things that I kind of like, so I, I, I think about two months ago, two or three months ago, uh, somebody sent me a link. Uh, it was like linktree.com slash learn about autism. And um, I found that site incredibly insightful, um, especially as somebody whose symptoms neurodivergent symptoms are different from the the way that we stereotypically think about them because like I have gone and done those like self-assessment tests online you know probably a dozen times throughout the last like five or six years and I've always really struggled with one understanding what it is that they're even asking me yep. Yep. <laughs> and two like it doesn't the way they ask the question it doesn't quite fit it doesn't quite work, right? Um, but what this website did was it highlighted, first it helps like explain that the spectrum is not what we tend to think about as like less severe and more severe, yes. right? 
Like that is not it at all, right? Like the spectrum is that we have all these different ways in which our like neurotypical or our, our, our neurons or our, our brain works um, that can be outside of, of uh, the way that we're anticipated like that it's anticipated that would work if we had like healthy, normal development, if that was even a thing. Um, I just want to say you air quoted that. <laughs> just, we're just listening. <laughs> right. Yes. Sorry. No problem. <laughs> You're right. Um, but uh, yeah, so the, it listed all of these different ways in which neurodivergence can show up. And, and in categories and that was so much more helpful for me to go oh yeah okay so in this category these are the things that I do right and then this category these are the things that I do um, and one of the things that it pointed out was that um, you know I'm sure that you've heard this I've heard this dozens of times that like we're all a little neurospicy or we're all a little autistic um, and what that site has helped me to understand is like now that's total bs yes, it is. <laughs> like and here is why we all may have, you know, a, a symptom or two within one or two of these categories of neurodivergence. But uh, like in order to have autism for in order for it to be um, something that is like officially like diagnosable, right? it has to be like across the board in multiple different categories and in ways that are like intense enough and frequent enough that it interferes with our ability to function in the, in society and the way in which society expects us to function. Yep. Or that Uh, we have to correct a lot to make it look like that's happening. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. That has been one of the things that's been really frustrating for me as well is like every time I try to talk about my own experience as somebody with neurodivergence, I often get like dismissed and minimized because um, because it doesn't look the way that uh, uh, that people anticipate it looking because I am really good and have been very good most of my life at masking. Yep. And, um, that's, a, and, and that's a safety mechanism. We learn mm-hmm. to mask to maintain our safety and security. Mm-hmm. Right, right. So I have been struggling in all of these different ways uh, throughout my entire life that um, other people had no idea that I was struggling, right? Because I didn't, I didn't share it. And like I said before, like I, I was too insecure to admit it to myself, let alone somebody else. <laughs> right. And right? I, I mean, and a lot of us thought that everybody went through the struggle. Right. And so I just can't do it right. 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 right? What's wrong with me? Right. Yeah. Right. I remember having somebody like I was struggling with like cleaning. Cleaning has been consistently one of those things that I have struggled with my entire life. Part of that is because I grew up with a family that was really chaotic and dysfunctional and we didn't, we didn't have routines. <laughs> we didn't have, you know, like I didn't have any foundation of that in my life, but also my brain gets all <laughs> when I see something, I see a, you know, a pile of stuff that needs to be addressed or I see the dishes piling up or whatever. And I walk into the kitchen and I see that and I immediately go into a freeze response. Right. And then it's like, I have no, I don't have the capacity to clean. Right. And I, I you know, I've had somebody like, even within the last handful of years, say to me, like, well, it's really easy just to do it this way. And it's like, yo, if it were really easy and if I could just do it that way, I, don't you think I would? <laughs> I think I would. <laughs> <laughs> like, who, who really wants to have a messy house? Like, I don't know anybody who wants that, right? <laughs> And this has been a point of like shame for me for a lot of my life too, right? It's like, why can't I, how, how is it that I got through a master's program um, with a, like a 3.98 GPA, right? Like, I think I got like one A minus, right? Like I got, got like, same, <laughs> like, exact same, <laughs> one A minus. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's amazing to me how I, I ended up going through an entire like clinical program and nobody noticed that I was severely traumatized and uh, <laughs> neurodivergent. I'm ashamed of us. <laughs> it, it, same. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I just want to pop on the end of that, that I, I've had a very similar experience. And 
you know, I was 47 years old and a therapist practicing who had already helped a lot of people before I realized I needed, for example, to go not contact with my family. So mm. just because you have education about something doesn't mean you understand what's going on inside of you mm -hmm. because it's inside of you and it's how we function. Mm -hmm. um, so can you believe we're already coming up on a half hour again? Oh my goodness. <laughs> I know. And I think, um, I think that what I would like to do is say one thing about a couple of things to watch out for when you okay. might start discovering neuroatypicality. And then I'd love for you to close this out with, you know, your tips. Okay. Um, so if, if you in the audience are starting to research, um, if you might have ADHD or ADHD or autism, there are a couple of words or uh, ways of describing experiences that you might be having that seem really, and here comes my language, they're really descriptions of what's happening. And that's two things. One is pathological demand avoidance. And I'm going to do, a, I think we may need to do a whole episode on that because it's a big deal. And the other is rejection sensitivity dysphoria. Oh, Those my goodness. drive me <laughs> nuts because again, it's saying you are the problem and you mm -hmm. are effed up. And mm -hmm. if you didn't have these issues, you wouldn't have issues. So okay. I just want to say real quick, what pathological demand avoidance, this is not a good definition deep, but overall what it means is the pressure you feel to be yourself and not fit in. So when somebody tells you to do something, you don't want to do it. Even if I have pathological demand avoidance with myself, I'm like, you need to go get that done. And the other part of me is like, screw you. I'm going to take a nap. <laughs> my, <laughs> my, my, my inner rebe rebel is like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So if you start hearing those words, please follow other people that can describe that in a way that's not so clinical and cold and inaccurate in my experience. The other is rejection, sensitivity, dysphoria. Like somehow you wouldn't have been hurt if you just had a little thicker skin. Mm. And dysphoria also means that you've been wrong about it. Lots of us with rejection, sensitivity have it for a really good reason. Right. It's because protected. we've been, dis we've been rejected our entire life. And every time we try to move towards a direction of being authentic, we get pushed back and we get told that we're not, we're doing it wrong. Exactly. So if you come across those two phrases and what you're learning about yourself, take a breath and realize that there can be truth there. And we need a better way to talk about those things. Mm -hmm. Right. And really understand what they're rooted in and understand what like what is actually happening, um, you know, on a physiological, neurological level, um, and like why why that's happening, and not right. just like oh that there's something just broken, <laughs> like, right? And and by the way, just my snarky comment uh, to wrap my part out: when you don't do what people want you to do, you're broken. Mm. That's the framework that that's coming from. When you don't do it our way or the way, which is white supremacy oriented again, uh -huh. then you're the problem. And I'm here to tell you the system's the problem. And there are a lot of us who are figuring that out. Mm -hmm. yep. Or when, or when um, I love how, like when we try it the way that they, we were told to try it, to do, do the things that we're told to do and it still doesn't work. Well, then we're just not doing it right. Right. <laughs> And, and and the number of times that I have heard that like gist of like uh, sentiment uh, from like professionals is like outrageous and out like uh, astonishing. Yes. Uh, it, like it just is like completely mind blowing to me that somebody would react that way, and it shows me that, that that's a reflection of them and those providers where they're at in their own internal judgment and their own internal. Um, projection like they're projecting on uh, everyone else what they have been taught as well which is that like you have to do it this way and this is the way to do it mm -hmm. uh, and like I think I think one of the biggest things that uh, I have learned about myself and my own recovery especially around this neurodivergence thing is that like it is so incredibly important for me 
to just be me, not pretend to be someone else, not pretend like no pretending, no masking, like n- none of it, just just existing as myself. I've realized that like I have been afraid to exist as myself my entire life. Mm. Uh, and like, and that is because it has been unsafe for me to exist as myself my entire life. Yep. And um, I have worked really hard, both as part of my trauma recovery process, and now also part of this process of uh, unpacking and understanding my neurodivergence has been to really focus on the people that I'm surrounding like myself with um, are people who love and accept me exactly as I am. Yeah. And that like when they see me, like like how I define love for myself as like on a much deeper level and understanding now is does this person feel as enthusiastically about me when I am at my worst as they do when I'm at my best? I feel like that's the perfect place to leave it. <laughs> it really is. Mm-hmm. And and it, it you have had to build that into your Mm -hmm. life. And I've had to build that into my life. And so I just want to end on an encouraging note that if you're listening, you too can build that into your life. So it'll take a long time and a lot of work. uh, And it is definitely possible and so worth it. So worth it. So worth it. Yes, absolutely. So Ace, thank you so much for being here with us for our two-parter. And Mm -hmm. um, I'm certain we will be talking with you in the future. In fact, Let's stay on the line after we say goodbye and schedule our next meeting. Okay. Sounds good. I really, I really appreciate it. Is there any last piece of or last thought that you would leave our audience? Now you're putting me on the spot. I totally put you <laughs> on the spot. You've you've had plenty of good thoughts. <laughs> I just you know what? I just I really want people to understand and, and know that they are exactly who they're meant to be. And that like even if they're not where they want to be yet that's okay that like it's that they're exactly where they are and that is all there is to it and that like they are worthy and deserving and like valuable exactly where they are with their imperfections not in spite of but because of right like so much like so much of what makes people special is their uniqueness is their like uh their own like true selves and like and I just want people I want people to feel what it feels like to know like that it's okay to just exist as you beautiful beautiful (laughs) and thank you for those of you starting out on your journey for making us a part of that process I hope that this has been helpful for you all Ace thank you again for your care your compassion your passion and your expertise. (laughs) And um, I look forward to talking with you more and finding out where you're headed. Um, If people want to get a hold of you, we'll leave information down in the description below so that they can contact you. And um, we'll see you next time. Thank you again, everybody, for being here with us on the CPTSD podcast. We wish you the best and we'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.